All right, good morning, people. Good morning online. We, uh, we just celebrated Easter last week. We ended up doing that in my backyard because this park was jam-packed. It was really full, even more full than a Sunday fun day. So we just celebrated Easter last week, uh, the glorious time of year where we look at uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. The part I love most is the resurrection part because he raised to life and gave me life in that, gave you life. And this God that raised from the dead and died on the cross loves us so, so much. God loves us so much. He accepts us as we are. Thank God. Right, Carmela? Carmela doesn't accept me all that much, but God does. So she knows that she has to accept me fully. He accepts us as we are. He accepts you as you are. Raise your hand if you know you got stuff that's messed up about you. Yes, not me. Only three of us. That's great. The rest of you, I'll tell you what your things are after service. If you'll form a line over here to my left. And I'm going to speak the truth in love. It's going to be, that's only the ones I know about. Yeah, it'll be the only ones that I've observed. Yeah, he accepts us as we are, but, but he loves us messed up people so much that he's not willing to leave us that way. And that's the beautiful part. That is, that's the part that I want to talk about, the process of being sanctified, the process of, of our lives transforming more and more and into Jesus, um, into the image of Jesus. Because I know some of us, we can think, oh, we've gotten to a point where we're satisfied with where we're at. But God's never satisfied with where we're at. There's always room for us to grow. There's always more that we can be in Christ Jesus. So this morning, I'm going to be reading out of the book of John. You Johns might be favorable to this passage of scripture here. Uh, The chapter is 12, if you want to read along verses 20 through 26 out of the NLT, New Living Translation. It says this, some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. He says this, and this is important. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. It's an interesting phrase. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. And those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity doesn't seem to make sense on its face, does it? But we'll dig in there a little bit today. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. These are Jesus' words to us written by John. And I think they're interesting. But what is Jesus saying here, actually? It, it doesn't make sense on the surface. It doesn't seem, it doesn't smack us in the face with as truth. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels. We never, we hardly ever associate death with new life and new birth, right? Death seems to be an ending to something. And that's important in and of itself. We'll get there too. But its death will produce, produce many new kernels, the plentiful harvest of new lives. I want new lives to come out of the death and resurrection of my life as i die more and more to myself i want people to see jesus in that death and that resurrection i want that for each and every one of us i want that for those of us who are watching online it doesn't necessarily make sense what jesus is saying here but we're going to dig into that a little bit he's obviously introducing a new way of life And Jesus did that a lot everywhere he went. He was telling stories of old and introducing it in a new capacity. Or he was telling a new story. Or uh, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this. And Jesus was going on. He was turning the narrative of the world, the narrative of scripture, the narrative of of the Hebrews, of the Jewish faith upside down and putting a twist on it. And, And this was a little bit difficult for them. And it's even difficult in our 
society today when we read these things, when we talk about death and resurrection and what that means. He's obviously introducing a new way, this way that has transformed uh, humankind since Jesus walked the face of the earth as a new path. It's a portal, if you will, a way into new life, a way into a better life, a way into becoming more and more like Jesus. Not a physical path, but a spiritual process for people who put their faith in Jesus, for believers, for followers of Christ to follow. It's, it's a way, it is the process. He's giving us the manual, the roadmap. He's saying, this is what it looks like and this is what is required to be like me. This is what's required. If you want to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you lay your life down and you die to yourself, you're going to gain it. That's what he's telling us. This process is for salvation, for the salvation of not only us, but others around us. As people follow, as they see our lives being transformed and we become more and more loving, more and more kind, more and more service oriented like Jesus Christ. When people see that they're drawn to us, it's what happens here in the park when we're being generous and we're shining the light of Jesus Christ to people who in other ways see the world as chaotic and dark. When they come and they experience the life that we're providing here, it is a stark contrast to what they see in the world. It's a spiritual model of crucifixion and resurrection. It's a process of metamorphosis and transformation. How many of you guys would say since you started Jesus Christ, you have changed from a caterpillar? Maybe you didn't make it into a butterfly yet, but at least you're a moth. Yeah. I'm, I'm at least a moth at this point, right? I may not be all colorful and beautiful and as pretty as Jesus wants me to be, but I got some wings and I can fly a bit, right? Yeah. I'm not crawling around on sticks and I'm not in a lumpy old body anymore. I'm I'm more like this moth. There's been a transformation in my life. There's been a transformation in your life. And if you want to be transformed, if this, if this life of yours is, is challenging to stay in the chaos of the world, the brokenness of your own mind and your own heart, this is the process of becoming more like Jesus and finding life, life more abundant, finding peace and finding joy. Again, in here, it says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And that's what we want to see is the birth of new life in people. I want to see people know Jesus like I know Jesus because families will be restored, because marriages will be restored. We've seen that in this group of people ourselves we've seen lives transformed and families reconciled just in this group of people at activate church luke 9 23 through 25 says this so then he uh then he said to the crowd if any of you want to be my followers you must give up your own way take up your cross and this is an interesting word daily it's hard right daily and follow me and if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. It doesn't make sense on the face, but I can tell you I'm living proof that this is the way that Jesus Christ, the life with Christ actually lives out and plays out. I feel like I own my life now. Like I have a new life in Christ because I've laid down all those desires. I look at my son oftentimes and I know all the things that as a young man, he looks at the world and thinks, there's all this opportunity out there for me to be something different, to gain all the wealth of the world, right? And I think many of us, we see the world that way when we're young. There's so much ambition. I'm going to do this with my life. And then God gets a hold of your life. And it becomes something different entirely. And yet all those things that you thought were going to satisfy you, when you lose your life to that, you actually become saved and you find your life you find the perfect life that jesus christ is offering you he's offering to each and every one of us and it says and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed well there's this process that jesus calls us into a daily process as he said here in this passage in luke it's death burial and resurrection right deny yourself 
That's a, that's a death part, is it not? There are things that we, you and I, desire in our own lives that we have to put to death in some ways because they're not of God. They're not the things that God has in line, in store for our lives. And there has to be a real death there in our lives. And then a burial, putting that away. And then when we're reborn with new ideas and, and new purpose, that's what God gives us. And that is the life that brings joy and the life that satisfies for us. But putting away our sinful ways to death, is it's difficult. And yet in this process, it's not that we put our, you know, the, the, the idea of baptism is that we're dying to ourselves and we're being raised up with Christ. But I love this word. I love the way that it's put in here. If you, anyone wants to follow, be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily. Because I believe, and we'll get to what Paul talks about in a moment, I believe there's this process that daily we must choose whether we're going to put what is on our agenda, like we just sang about this morning, what's on our agenda, if we're going to put that to death and put God's agenda in front of it, we have to put that to death and be resurrected into this life. There's a daily death and resurrection process that we must go through. It's interesting and significant that Jesus was killed on a Roman cross because any old death wouldn't do for Jesus, right? It had to be the most excruciating. It had to be this process of, uh, of torment and, 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 and suffering. Because, and, and I believe this, you know, stoning wouldn't do. It's too fast. There are other ways to die. Hanging too quick breaks your neck. You go unconscious pretty quickly. But this idea of crucifixion is, is meaningful in this process in our journey with Jesus. Because the cross is a symbol of immense pain and immense torture. It's the most excruciating way to die. As a matter of fact, the word excruciating comes from the word cross because being the, the Romans had figured out, they had cornered the market on the way to make it the most painful way to kill and torture and humiliate an individual. They would put you on a cross and you didn't die immediately. It took a long time and it was agonizing. Meanwhile, you're up there naked or half naked amongst all of your peers mocking you and spitting at you. It's the most, if, if, if there's a way to die that is the most excruciating, I would imagine that this is it. And this is the way that our king dies. The cross is this symbol of immense pain and torture. I believe the cross is used to signify the pain and anguish that, like Jesus, we will endure putting our own lives and our own agenda to death. Let me ask you this, raise your hand or at least acknowledge is it hard as a Christian to put to death the things that you wanted to do in the world? The way that you want to treat people when they come at you? You know, I, I see these memes, you know, and it's like this sloth with his arms out and he's like, come at me, bro. And that, that's kind of like the way I feel sometimes. And yet I know it's, it's excruciating for me to put that to death and go, I'm going to greet them with loving and kind words. Yeah. Like, like that's what we're being called into. And th that's not a one-time thing. Oh, I got it right that time, right? God, okay, I'm good with it now. No, it's every time that God puts somebody like that in our lives, right? It, it could be a family member. It could be someone who is your own child. It could be a spouse that you love so much. It could be a parent. It could be a brother, a sister, an in-law. It's excruciating in many ways, suffering like Christ did in many ways. But the reality is that we must put to death sin in our lives, like Jesus put to death all of our sin when he did that on the cross. And it's not easy to do. It's not easy. It's difficult to give up that flesh part of our lives, right? I remember a guy talking one time and he was like, I'm a Christian, but barely. So don't mess with my family. You know, it's that part. It's that part we want to hold on to, right? Like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but just barely. You know, it's the not, it's the not beautiful part of our humanity that it's hard to put to death. Because there's a beautiful part of humanity, right? We know it when we see it. 
we see it in advertisements a lot of times when you know the i mean i cry dennis laughs at me because we've gone to some kings games and and a lot of times they have some family come down on the ice and and then their soldier dad or somebody will come or husband will sneak up on them they don't even know that they're stateside and it's like that's the beautiful side of humanity, right? The part that touches you deep. It's like that connection aspect of it. We know beauty in humanity when we see it, but the reality is there's this part of humanity in our lives that is ugly too, right? That's the not beautiful part of humanity that needs to be put to death. It's, it's this part that God's holy nature is not shining through in our humanity. I'm talking about this part of humanity that becomes the evil. It's the evil that comes out of us. The thing that we do and we go, where did that come from? Like, I, I didn't even know I was capable of that. Or saying those words to that person. That's the part that we have to put to death. Because it looks nothing like Jesus. And it doesn't produce fruit. And it doesn't draw people to Jesus. You know, it's a strange thing for Jesus to mention for a Jewish rabbi, which he was, to mention the cross. It would have been shocking to first century Jews for Jesus to mention the cross because this was before he was crucified. And yet he's talking about being crucified and he's talking about the cross in that way. The cross was this torture instrument introduced by Romans to terrorize people like Jews. The cross was a, another instrument of public humiliation and Jesus was foreshadowing what he was going to go through. He was telling his people already, this is the suffering that I'm going to go through. He, he meant that he was going to have to die on a cross in an excruciating, excruciating way before we could live. Now we must die to ourselves. And this is the hard part, our rights. As Americans, um, we have a bill of rights part of who we are we grow up knowing I, i've got the right to say whatever i want to right freedom of speech i can say whatever i want to and you can't do a thing about it and we think about these things all the time about our rights and yet to follow jesus many of our rights get superseded by responsibility yeah. right the responsibility to the king the responsibility to the way, the responsibility to the Holy Spirit in living a way that's honoring of God. And it's not all about our rights as Americans. It's about our responsibilities as Christians. What are we living for? What are we doing in this life? How are we being transformed into the image of God by our daily death, burial, and resurrection, and putting to death those ugly parts of our humanity the parts that we wouldn't want to talk about. You know, we do a pretty good job, I think, oftentimes of presenting our the polished side, the good side of our humanity. And yet, um, it is interesting when you get to be around, you know, even Christians for a period of time, and a long weekend or a week at Royal Family Kids Camp. And, and, you know, it's dirty and hot, stressful, long days. You didn't get all sleep. You didn't sleep on a comfortable bed. It's like, oh, yeah. I, there's some there's humanity in there still huh? the, not the good kind that's the part that we try to hide and yet that part those are the things that I'm talking to us about today what are those things the things that only you know about the things that only you know about oh I don't want that part to get out I don't like people discussing my business the part I'm driving at today is this idea of of sin in our lives. What is the sin in our lives that that entangles us? The part that we try to hide, the part that needs to be put to death so that we can become all that God wants us to be. What are the things that would be embarrassing if they were put up behind me on a screen and your name was attached to it? What are those things because I, I think it's those things, as I've walked with Jesus for a long time, I'm not fully sanctified, guys. There are things in my life I'm not proud of. You know, sometimes I'm not proud in the moment, and I'm like, what am I doing? But I can't train. It's, I can't stop myself. It's like, what am I doing right now? It's stupid. You too? Anybody? Maybe you guys online. It's, it's those things that we have to, we've got to care about. 
Because Jesus died on a cross, was buried and resurrected to give us the power to overcome all of those things in our life. Not just the ones where we get to be good enough. I started out today by telling us we're not good enough at anything. There's always better for us in Jesus Christ. There's always more he requires of us. And when we get there, we're not going to miss these, these ugly things that we're hanging on to anyways. You guys know that. There have been things that you've held on to for a while and you found relief by putting that thing to death by bringing it out into the light, by sharing it with somebody else. Like, hey, I struggle with this. This is hard for me. I need to get over this. Help me be accountable to get over this. Ask me about this. It's no wonder that Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Because he wants that freedom for us. I'm not proud of all the things that I do, but I want to be. And you guys want to be proud of all the things that you do? Yeah, I do too. And and our Father God wants to be proud of all the things that we do. So he's given us this beautiful process of dying daily for this death, this burial, and this resurrection for our lives to be changed. We have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our rights. We have to die to the desire, and this is the hard one for some of us, of being our own boss. That was a hard one for me. I, I knew I was 20 something early married and I was like, man, I know what I'm going to do. And I had the skill set to do it. God blessed me with the skill set to do it. I'm good with people. I can do sales. I'm going to make a bunch of money and I'm going to do the things that I want to be my own boss. And yet my life just took a U-turn from where I thought it was going to go. It, it just, it's just nowhere in the vicinity of the quadrant of the universe that I thought I was going to find myself in. And I'm just grateful that Janie stayed with me because she knew the trajectory of the life that I was heading in. And now she's on this ride with me. And I tell her to blame that on God. You can't blame it on me. It wasn't my plan. She knew my plan from the from the, the outset. If you got problems with that, you take that up with God. You know, it's not my bad. I'm just trying to follow, babe. She's doing what I'm supposed to do. Love it. I don't think it's working. She's still with me. But we have to die to ourselves, our rights, this desire of being our own boss. We have to die daily. And you guys might look at me, you know, oh yeah, Jeremy does these things, right? It's like, there are still times in my life when I go, man, I, I, I see that other path. Oh yeah. And I have to die to that daily. Because the, these things that I don't even know what they are yet, this collection of good deeds and things that God has laid out for me in my life to accomplish for in as many years as he gives me, that's what lays ahead for me. And I have to die to my own selfish ambition and the things of this world, the shiny things of this world. I have to do that regularly and continue. It gets easier, right? It gets easier and there's a lot of joy in it. I, I, don't, I don't look at my life begrudgingly at all. I love the life that God has given me. It's not what I would have chosen, but that's what I got. And that's what I want for you. I want that for all of us, right? I want that for each and every one of us. But it takes this process of sanctification. It's a cycle. There's these three separate and distinct steps. They're intertwined and they're interdependent. The first, you know, it's to deny yourself, take up your cross and to follow Jesus. And it's difficult. The denying yourself part, it's difficult. Taking up the cross, crucifying the sin in your life, putting that stuff to death, it's it's humiliating. It, it causes anguish in our life. The process of continually dying and being resurrected into but the process is what it, the, the the process is what creates the transformation that Jesus is doing in our lives. When we get in this cycle of doing it daily, it's people on the outside. I'll tell you a story. Um, I was surprised for my 40th birthday. 
I know you guys don't think I'm 40 years old yet, but some of you guys were there. I was surprised for my 40th birthday. A bunch of people showed up to church and we had a surprise party for me and all that. And and uh, Amanda and Janie, and they had gone out of their way to get people to say kind things on video about me. Just to give a testament of my life and what I had meant to them. And, and one of my friends who was there just celebrating me, um, who's a little older or a little younger than me, we were having lunch uh, a few weeks later, he said, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm impressed and I'm also challenged because I've seen the, the turn that your life made and the person that you've become and how much it's meant to the people around you and the people that you've led and the things that have happened. And he says, I don't know that that is, that my life would be characterized if, if I had people, if somebody did the same thing for me. He said, but I want that. And, and that meant a lot to me because people on the outside had seen that there had been a transformation in my life, that, that it's hard to see when you're in the middle of it, right? But I see that in each of you. I see our, our willingness to serve, our willingness to show love and ca- com- kindness and compassion to people, even here in the park when we do our Sunday fun day. You know, it's, it's infectious and it's life-changing and we're growing together, you and I. But for all this to happen, we have to put these things to death, right? The anger in our lives, the aggression, greed, the selfishness, the lust and conceit and deceit and the pride and the ego. That's a hard one. That's a hard one for me. I'll just be honest. That's a hard one for me. Because sometimes I just think, man, I'm pretty good at stuff. I am, but I don't want that to be what I'm characterized as, right? There's a lot of people who are a lot better at these things than I am. I'm not got great at anything, and I think the Bible says that pride goes before destruction, and I don't want to be destroyed. I want to be sanctified. I want to be lifted up. I want us to be, and and it's hard to put those things because because when somebody sins against us, we want to we want to get back at them, right? But that just comes from pride and ego. If you don't care so much about your pride or your ego, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. Like, oh, wow, what's wrong with that person? And that's a nice place to be. I've seen people get all angry at me before and like attack me. I'm like, wow, there must be something really wrong with you. I'm gonna pray for you, buddy. That doesn't, doesn't bother me at all now. But these are the things that we, we must overcome and we must do it daily. This idea of, of getting over that, that pride and ego is important. Harry Truman said something very interesting. You know, we're going to do amazing things together and our lives are characterized by the things that God does through our lives. And Harry, President Harry Truman didn't do everything perfect, but he, he said this, and I think this is important. He says, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And, and I, I agree with that. I think, I think the stumbling block for most of us is, is the issue of pride. We want to be seen as a player on the stage. I, 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 and I'll be honest, like, I don't know who watches this, maybe some of my pastor friends. Like, you know, there are times when, uh, you know, I've, I've led a large church. Our church is not large at this point. I've led it. This church has been larger in the past. All of the other pastors in our group lead larger, larger churches than me. And it, sometimes I go, man, should I just throw in the towel? Just give up on this thing? Should, like, why? Like, we could just go to one of these other churches and should be a part of it, you know? And and the reality is this, it's like, I, I don't care. I, I need to not care about that, and I don't care about that anymore. It's like this Sunday fun day stuff. It's like the things that we do together. I don't, and that's what I love about Joel, and I love about um, Chris and joining with us. It's not about our congregations and getting people to come back. It's a, really about honoring Jesus in what we're doing and trying to bring life to people, trying to introduce them, trying to get them to the bridge to introduce them to who Jesus is, to taking a step forward with us, right? And for us, I, I told Joel at the beginning, I said, hey, dude, if we're going to do this stuff together, like just now, I don't care if, you know, if we make a difference in people's lives and they go to Radiant, I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm going to be happy that we're doing this thing together. And I think this speaks to the maturity of us as people, but we don't care about that thing. I think it speaks to this, the, the evidence that this process has been happening in our lives, that we are maturing as people. We have been dying to ourselves, to our own ego. 
And the reality is, it is amazing what we can accomplish when we don't care who gets the credit. And then Jesus gets the credit. That's the only one we want to get the credit. We just want people to meet Jesus. That's why we do this thing. There's a lot of work to do the stuff that we do, right? You, some of you guys put countless hours in of preparing and setting up and being out here. I know I do. I know I spent tons of hours like thinking these things through. I spent three, four hours with Joel each week just starting to plan for the next month and who's going to do this and who are we going to invite into this area and how are we going to raise up volunteers to take over parts of this because it's becoming a beast of its own. It's becoming unmanageable. We had probably 350, 400 people out here last month and it was like, well, we plan to feed like 200 and we fed more than that, but it's like, how are we going to feed more people now? How are we going to get them to come around? How are we going to engage them? How are we going to raise up people who who can make that connection? It's by us going through this process, becoming less about ourselves and more about the kingdom of God. But it, but you and I, we have to do something very important in our lives for the health of our families, for the health of this family, for this church, for the health of the kingdom of God. We have to put sin to death. We, we can't dabble with sin. It has to be crucified. It has to suffer an excruciating and humiliating death in our lives. We have to put sin to death so that we can be more like Christ. I, if we think of ourselves as a container and you're a mixed bag, uh, maybe let's say some white balls in a container and some black balls in a container. Let's call the black ones sinful areas in your lives and the white ones parts of your life that have been sanctified. The reality is for our lives to become more like Christ, the black ones have to come out and those need to be replaced by new heavenly qualities, new spiritual qualities that God is desiring to put into our lives. So we have to put sin to death because sin is a killer. It's a destroyer. It's what separates us from people. It's what makes us ineffective. It's what binds us up. It's what entangles us. You know, it's interesting. My aunt had a, she had a snake when I was a kid. Um, I was probably 10 or 12 years old, maybe Gianna's age or something. And she had a snake. And it's interesting when you think you can play with a snake and you can grab a snake and you're like, hey, I got it. And then very quickly you realize, no, it's got me because it wraps its arm, it, I mean, it wraps its body around your fist and your arm. And the next thing you know, it's like, I can let go of this thing and it doesn't, I don't have it anymore. It's got me. And the reality is, and I think it's interesting that sin and Satan is characterized by a snake in the garden. Because when we dabble with sin and we don't put it to death in our lives and we think we can hold it at bay and we think we can control it, I'll just do a little bit of this sin. It's like grabbing a snake and thinking you have a hold of it but it's actually got a hold of you. Yeah. Sin is nothing to play with. It's nothing to get comfortable with. It's what put our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's those sins that are, they, they get us all mixed up with people, right? It's the hard ones like gossip. Uh, it's so easy to catch yourself just talking about other people, their business, not in an unedifying way, right? right? I don't like it, but it just comes so natural to us. Yeah. But we gotta be in the process of putting that to death. How about the sin of apathy? It's so easy to become apathetic right. about the things that are going, oh, my life's fine, that's fine, I'm good, I'm good. We're so fortunate that Jesus Christ wasn't sitting in heaven. He's like, hey, we got all these sinful people down there on earth, we need to save them. And he looked at God and goes, I'm good. Right. I'm good. I don't want to go do that cross thing. Oh, that's a hard pass on that, right? So we've got to put the sin of gossip and apathy to death in our lives. We've got to care. We've got to care about these people around here. Why? Because God does. I don't want to do what we do over here. It's not like for me. It's like a lot of work. 
So I constantly manage a bunch of volunteers and cook and food. And I'm not saying I don't like some of it. I like some of it. And I love what happens, but it, but it is, but it's a lot of work. It'd be a lot easier for me to stay at home, sit on my couch, hang out with my family, do something fun for myself. And yet I, I constantly, we constantly have to put that apathy to death in our lives. It's important and it makes a difference. So I have a question for you guys as we wrap up here. What sin are you tinkering with? Who's the snake that you're hanging on to? What's the sin you're tinkering with that needs to be put to death so that you can bury that and then be resurrected into new life each and every day? What is that sin? What needs to be put to death in your life? What do you think you've got a grip on? But really, if you're honest, maybe some of your family members would tell you, no, nope, you're entangled in that. It's got you. It's got you. This is why denying and dying to yourself is so important. Colossians 2.20, it says this, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. We are no longer stuck and forced to be gripped by the sin. We have the power through Jesus Christ to overcome the sin that so easily entangles us in our lives. The question is, are you going to put it to death? I'm not just talking about the other one. I'm talking about apathy too. I think one of the major, and this is my, I'll, I'm not getting on this soapbox, but I'm going to say it. The American church is in many ways so apathetic to the world and the suffering around us. It, it's sin and we become entangled in it. And it's why we been, become ineffective in this world. You've died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of the world. We too can say, I die daily. Paul was totally sold out to God, and we can be as well. You know, I look to Paul, and Paul is not Jesus, but Paul is a good human example. He was not a deity, but he was a human example of what a human being can be in this world and the effect he can have on this world if you don't care about who gets the credit or what happens to you, or if you've got a place to live, or if you end up in jail. When you have no concerns the effectiveness you can have for the kingdom of god is intangible it's crazy what you can do it's extraordinary it's more than we could ask or imagine and and my prayer for us is that as individuals we grow in that capacity and as a community of faith we grow in that capacity we don't care about who gets the credit we just want jesus to get the credit that's all we want to put this sin to death so that we can be infilled with Jesus Christ more and more each day. John 12, 35 and 36 says this. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. And I pray that we are growing continually, becoming children of the light being sanctified more and more each day through the process of deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus Christ. It's important because when you grow, we grow. And when you change, we change. And when you develop new skills, we develop new skills. And when you put sin to death, we have put sin to death. And when, you, when your love gets deeper, our love gets deeper. That's why it's important for us as individuals to do what we've talked about today. So as we leave, as we go throughout our business this week, I pray that you'll have a conversation with God and say, God, illuminate those things to me. And again, my offer stands. If you want to line up and you want me to tell you what's wrong in your life, just line up over here after the service is over and I'll, I'll let you know. Kidding. Let's pray. <sighs> Jesus, we love you and yet we want to love you more. God, you are so faithful to us and we want to grow in faithfulness to you. God, I pray. 
God, my desire is that we would think about you more than we think about the other things in our lives. That, that a, uh, a majority of our time would be scheming and dreaming of what you're doing in your kingdom and you're doing in our lives because we will be a church that is unstoppable. I pray that this community, God, the, the ones that I love here so much who have been with us through thick and thin, God, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would draw us closer together. And I pray that, that we would be a catalyst for the transformation of the church here in Huntington Beach in Orange County. And as we take that far beyond that, that your light would shine bright here in this county as a result of these people and the lives that they live, not just here in the park, but in their apartment complexes, in our cul-de-sacs, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, God. I pray that you would give us the courage and the fortitude to put to death the sin in our lives so that we can become more like you. That we would take this process of denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following you. We would take that process seriously and we would do it daily. We would choose to honor you daily and become more like you. We ask these things in your holy, precious name.